Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Greetings from Biospectrum Asia. Welcome to the West Pharmaceutical Webinar. We are the co-host for today's webinar. I am Ankit Kankar, and I'm the product manager for Biospectrum Asia. Biospectrum is an integrated B2B media platform for the bioscience industry in the Asia-Pacific region. Before we start the webinar, there are a few house rules which I would like to take you through. All participants are on listen mode only. If you have any questions, please be patient and type your questions once the Q&A session pop up on screen. We will answer a few Q&A if time permits. This webinar will be available on demand on biospectrumasia.com for next six months. In today's webinar, our expert, Jia Min Bu, uh, will be discussing the growing importance of the container closure integrity testing. Jia Min Bu is from Singapore and holds a bachelor degree in material science engineering from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She joined West Pharmaceutical Services Singapore PTE Limited as of July 2013 as a technical account specialist. In her role, she provides technical support, support to pharma companies in the Asia-Pacific region, providing product recommendations, technical training, and advices to ensure a smooth and easy uptake of West wide product portfolio as required for customer direct product application. Let me introduce you to Jia. Jia Min. Hi, Jia Min. Thank you, Anki, for the kind introduction. So. For today, I will be going through this hot topic of the pharmaceutical industry, especially uh, for the regulated market. This topic is gaining uh, more and more interest and importance. So uh, container closure integrity and I'll be using the short form CCI in this webinar. The content for my webinar today so we'll be covering the basics, what CCI is about, and some considerations to select the components that make up our package and regulatory expectations. So we'll go through um, some regulatory guidelines, well-known regulatory guidelines on this CCI topic. Then we'll move to this critical factor or limit that has to be established for each product package called the maximum allowable leak limit, more for short. So with this limit, then we can, then it will enable us to select the suitable CCI test methods. Okay, so we'll look into a few CCI test methods. Finally, just a very brief promotion on what WES can do to support our customers' evaluation over the product package CCI. Okay, so this polling question we will skip. Right, so for the basics of CCI, This is the definition that we have pulled out from Guidance Chapter USP 1207. So this, um, in this chapter, CCI is defined as the ability of a package to prevent product loss, to block the ingress of microorganisms, to limit entry of detrimental gases or other substances, thus ensuring that the product meets all necessary safety and quality standards. So a few key points actually we can learn right away from the definition is that CCI is no longer only concerned of the sterility of the drug product. Okay, so no longer only concerning the ingress of microorganisms, but also um, it needs to prevent product loss or entry of gases or substances that could impact the product safety and quality. Okay, so over to the right, we have a list of possible CCI failures. So not just sterility and contamination, which has been the main focus and testing purpose. But there's this other uh, failures that, has, that could impact the product safety and quality with the exchanges of the vial content and the external environment.
Okay, here we have a fishbone diagram of the considerations and when we look at a product package, CCI. So there are, we separate all these considerations into their various different branches. And for today, we will only focus more on the materials, process and measurement. So the material and process will be covered under the component selection portion and measurement under the CCI test methods portion. Okay, but the rest, equipment, environment, people are also very important, though they are more of the process related um, considerations that we need to then qualify and validate plus the procedures that need to be set for the technicians to follow. Okay, so we move on to component selection. So an overview of the factors that could impact an integral package when we look at um, individual components. So over here, we will just look at a valve stopper system for simplicity. So if you look at a valve stopper system, valve usually is, the usual material is actually glass. So glass has a very low permeability of, uh, in fact, it is a non-permeable material. So there is um, a very, very low or minimum risk to CCI failure as compared to the rubber component. So over here, I've only listed actually the rubber component part. So for a rubber stopper, there is the formulation factor. So it could be made of different elastomer type, isoprene butyl or isoprene butyl blend. And this material, different rubber formulation could actually have different functional properties and different hardness value. So with different functional properties upon puncture, they can resue differently or their resue capability would be different. So the risk uh, in CCI failure would have to be evaluated, especially if the application is for multi-dosed. And then if we look at hardness, definitely it would impact the compression. And so the crimping process would need to optimize to the particular rubber stopper we are working with. Okay. Then stop, rubber stoppers come in different designs. So even in West, we have 100 over designs. So the design portion would impact, um, especially if we look at a valve stop system, the critical part would be the flange thickness because that is the material that the aluminum seal has to cream over. So the material, how thick the stopper flange is, would impact the crimping and how suitable the various components are for each other. Okay, this stack up tolerance uh, is a calculation that can help evaluate if the combination work. So we'll take a look at this in our later slides. Elasticity of coating. So uh, usually rubber stoppers, because it's rubber, so it needs, we would typically treat the surface, uh, whether it's for lubricity purposes or for barrier purposes. So in rest, we have this flum. So this flums and especially the flums, because it's a polymer flum that's laminated over the rubber stopper, they can actually restrict the elasticity of the rubber material, the bare rubber material. So therefore, when we apply this film, we actually have to take note not to apply over the ceiling areas so that we do not impact the CCI adversely. Okay, then finished good storage step temperature. For a rubber stopper, because it's a rubber material, it is inherently um, easily affected 
Actually, it would be affected if there is elevated heat input, especially for long durations. So it is recommended that the rubber components are stuck in controlled warehouse condition. Okay, so temperature range within daily median of um, 0 to 35 degrees Celsius is the recommended uh, temperature range. Then we have component processing. So component processing, so all these processes, again, whichever processes that we apply to the components, we need to make sure that they are qualified and validated such that they do not impact the component properties and performance. Then we have defects and contamination, especially at ceiling surfaces. So if there is a defect or contamination at the surface, it could impact and cause a leakage pathway. Okay, so this would then depend on the manufacturing process to make sure that the manufacturing uh, is performed with good current GMP, good manufacturing practices, and it's a qualified, consist qualified process to be able to produce consistent quality products. All right, so now we look. We have looked at factors for individual components. Now we take a look at a system. So for a system, if you look at the assembly process first. So assembly process, there are various assembly. The assembly parameters definitely have to be optimized. Okay, so like I mentioned, there are various different factors for the components. So the SMB parameters have to be optimized for the particular components that is used. Okay, so that example would be insertion force and also capping environment, which could introduce contamination. Then um, percent compression and residual seal force are two tests that can be performed to evaluate and verify the seal quality. Container closure storage conditions. So again, after we have our finished product, the creamed stopper valve system, the storage condition is important because in fact, that is the longest duration that the finished product will maintain in, in a drug product life cycle stages. So that is the longer stage storage stage. So the temperature and pressure at that stage must be evaluated. Okay, especially when there is really um, special and extreme cases such as cold temperature storage. Okay, so at a very low temperature. In later slides, we also look at why cold storage temperature needs more or more consideration. Okay, just to add, not just cold storage. Um, over here, we only look at valve. Something to add would be if it is a syringe or a cartridge system, then we in fact the pressure and temperature conditions then is critical. Because for example, if there is a change in the in the pressure, it could cause movement of the plunger in the barrel through the barrel. So the differential in pressure could cause the plunger to move, and that itself could cause a CCI breach. Okay, so this is also another example of, you know, for different um, drug product, we need to consider when there is, um, at the, how the package will be at its different stages. Where are the failure modes? Okay, so. Before we move further to look so at the critical factors, we need to know where our primary seal is so that we know which are the critical, critical factor. So if we look at this, um, again, a valve stopper system, number one is the plug valve seal. So it's the sealing between the stopper legs or plug. 
against the inner surface of a valve. So this seal is called the secondary sealing surface. Okay, is this it is the important sealing surface before the aluminum seal is crimped and kept over the stopper and valve. So it is the interim stage, but it's important, especially for very sensitive drug. Okay, then there is the ring and transition seal, which is not as important. And finally, number three, lens seal. This is the seal between the stopper flange and the bow crown. Okay, so this is the primary sealing surface and it is the most critical sealing surface of a finished product. When the aluminum seal has been creamed over, capped over the stopper and bow. So understanding that this is the primary and the most critical seal, this, this is where this stack up assessment actually um, derived from and is um, intent to assess. Okay, so what this stack up assessment do is that it checks theoretically, uh, it's a mathematical equation that calculates if there is sufficient aluminum seal skirt length to produce an acceptable cream so it has it will if it can what it means is if it can cover um, appropriately the rubber stopper flange so the rubber stopper flange thickness here comes into play and then the valve crown height before holding slightly under the valve crown height to produce the right cream. Okay, so over on the left, this is a picture of an acceptable cream. And the right is an unacceptable cream. So over here it's written here that it is only cosmetic defect. So if you can see there are actually folds over the aluminum seal skirt. So what it mean what it actually have what actually happened is that there is too much aluminum seal skirt that it forms the folds okay and this is cosmetic because it has the aluminum skill set has not run down to the bow neck yet okay if it is too long that it runs down the bow neck then in that for that instance for that case there is possible there's, there is possibility of the CCI breach CCI failure because then the forces that was concentrated at the primary seal, primary sealing surface could be distributed away onto the away into the bow neck, which is not where we want the which is not where the critical seal is. Okay, so with the calculation, theoretic calculation, definitely it gives us an idea, but we still have to get the samples to test it to verify the CCI of the product package. Okay, so um, testing via CCI test and then also running them through the actual fill finish line and actual crimping. Okay, so why? So definitely because there is different type of capping equipment out in the industry and um, different equipments perform differently. Okay, so here are some factors. Firstly, because there is different equipment, different components, the, we definitely have to, to optimize the capping equipment parameters according to the component we are using. Okay. Especially there are special components, packaging components out there. For example, uh, there is this type of tip off seal, the aluminum seal with a plastic button attached to the aluminum seal. And there is this special design which is called the flush button. So this type of flush seal has a button that is um, of the similar diameter as the aluminum seal. Okay, so this type of seal compared to the 
typical one which has the button that is wider than the aluminum seal. The flush button is slightly less tolerant, is less tolerant to irregular forces. So it could break off easier as compared to the standard seal. So for such special component, we need to evaluate and make sure that the parameters are, uh, has been tuned, optimized for such components. Then the crimping of the metal um, skirt, the mechanics, mechanics behind, there are different types of um, mechanics. There's the real this type, there's the jaw type. So usually jaw is used by the R&D scale labs. And usually production rail and this type is used because of their higher speed and new rate. Okay. Another thing is that rail and this type in fact produce generally produce more consistent cream versus a jaw type. Okay, then um, last but not least, we have the applied force. So the applied force during the capping process. So this is also another critical factor because if too much force is applied onto the seal, it could cause the rubber stopper to bulge out. Okay, bulge upwards. And if it bulges upwards, it could cause the seal to break and pop off. But if there is too little compression, then you could have loose caps or loss of CCI. Okay, now we move on to the regulatory expectations. Here we have a chart that summarizes the reason for the product recalls uh, cases gathered from two zero year 2010 to year 2014. So it is a summary of all recall, of recalls of different dosage forms, but injectable stands a large portion, almost half. So the reason um, is a good representative for injectables as well. So of all the reasons, leakage is the top three reason for the product recalls. Okay. So this goes to show that, in fact, CCI failures is not uncommon. It is a troubling issue that we should focus on. And it is critical that it, would, it could cause recalls because it, in fact, would impact the product safety and quality. So now we look at the development of regulatory guidance over CCI. Okay, so this is a brief summary of how the guidance actually developed over the years regarding this CCI topic. So prior to 1990s, the understanding is that sterility testing is alone is sufficient. So sterility testing, microbial ingress, um, dye ingress is always the go-to way to verify that the drug products maintain their sterility throughout shelf life. Okay, and it was only in 1994 um, from a FDA guidance for human and veterinary drug products that the message the message changed. So, in this 1994 FDA guidance. It is informed that sterility testing alone is insufficient. Microbial barrier properties of a parenteral drug product, drug package, sorry, product package, which is actually CCI, must be verified. Okay, then further on, 1998, uh, we, the PDA group actually came together to produce this technical report number 27 to give guidance to the industry on how to evaluate CCI for their drug product. Okay, 
So PDA is Parenteral Drug Association. They are really association made up of um, different drug companies coming together to um, discuss about various critical topics for the pharmaceutical industry. And they would produce such guidance to help the market move forward. Okay, so they came up with this technical report that give that gave a very uh, rather detailed guidance on uh, CCI application across the drug product life cycle. They gave examples and selections ways of um, selecting different CCI test methods. They even discussed about microbial uh, versus physical methods. So it was a very it was a very detailed and useful guidance. However, the, it did not influence um, much physical actual changes in the industry. Okay, because it is not from a regulatory uh, source, right? It's not a regulatory party uh, team. So then only. Um, after 10 years down the road, in 2008, another FDA guidance came up. So this is an FDA guidance for sterile products. And in it, it's a very short guidance, but very clearly it mentions that it encourages the use of CCI tests instead of sterility tests. And um, from that time onwards, they actually do not require uh, drug manufacturers to compare the usage of these physical methods to the microbial ingress risk. Okay, then finally in 2016, uh, we have this official guidance from USP chapter 1207 and it gave a very detailed guidance again on how uh, CCI can be applied uh, over a drug product life cycle how to go the different test methods how to go about selecting them the need for validation and package they even talk about package seal quality tests which is tests that you can perform to qualify the seal okay not cci but seal quality and also the term that they introduce deterministic and probabilistic methods so a deeper look into this USP1207. Here are some key points we've taken from this USP chapter 1207. Okay, uh, again, it's a very good guidance that um, inform that um, actually tell us how to do evaluation, monitoring um, of the product package system integrity throughout the different life cycle stages of a product. Okay, and several uh, messages, um, important messages. Number one, there is not one test method um, that would be appropriate for all product package system. Okay, so method selection is required. And when you select the method, after selecting the method, we have to validate the method according to the drug product application. Okay. And the method that's selected uh, it is preferable to be a deterministic method wherever possible compared to uh, over a probabilistic method. Okay. So a summary, the gist um, that the guidance try to inform is that CCI methodology will be specific to the product and system. Okay, so um, there is not one method that can be applied to all, and you, know, you can just choose this one method for our for one drug product throughout its life cycle stages. Okay, it is not really it's not feasible that way. Okay, so general regulatory expectations. CCI must be addressed. You know, this is something um, that in fact is a must, especially for regulated markets. Okay, and as mentioned, there are actually different ways to evaluate CCI of a product package. And USP chapter 1207 is a good guidance to guide these activities. So again, CCI, the evaluation is 
focus on patient safety and requires drug manufacturers to utilize um, critical thinking to apply and evaluate in a science and space with a, with a science and space approach. Okay, wherever possible to use deterministic methods versus probabilistic methods. Okay, because deterministic methods are actually space and uh, science and space approach versus um, probabilistic, which depends on variable opportunistics, opportunistic events. Methods selected should be sensitive enough to address the maximum allowable leak limit and should be validated. So again, well, um, so these are a few uh, critical stages from the various guidance. Okay, so now we go to the maximum allowable leak limit. So this is the term that is introduced. Um, actually, it's even introduced before this chapter came up, but slowly with this chapter, it gains recognition. Okay, so in short, it's more. It means the greatest leakage rate or leak size tolerable for a given product package, posing no risk to the product safety and quality. So the largest leak that is acceptable. Okay, so again, CCI is not just focusing on sterility risk, but also product quality risk. So over in this table, we have uh, the different type of leaks of concern and their corresponding risk to product quality. Okay, so previously the focus was just um, that the product package has to uh, prevent the entry of microorganisms okay, because it will impact the product sterility. But now not just the first row, we need to take note of um, the second and third. So escape of the product and definitely it, could, it will cause failure of relevant product physical chemical quality attributes and changes in gas headspace so this one is dependent on the drug product so if a certain gas has to be or a certain content or vacuum has to be maintained in the headspace then well this the product package has to be able to do that Okay, again, it could then impact if there's failure to the and cause a change in the gas head space, it could cause failure and impact the product physical chemical quality attributes and or hindrance of product access by the end user. So at times the gas head space is maintained for the product package to be able to function. Okay, so if there's a change in the headspace, then it will affect the function, the, the way to assess and use the, the drug product. Okay, so this is also one important point if the particular drug product has that function. So how to determine the mall? Okay, so the mall is, just now we mentioned, is the maximum leak allowed for a particular product package. And it looks into not just sterility, but preservation of product content, prevention of entry by gases or substances affecting the drug product safety and quality. So in other words, to determine more, we actually we need to understand what is the what are the failure modes possible of the particular product package. And we need to understand the processing distribution, storage and use, the different um, stages, different scenarios uh, that the drug product is at, is in. Okay, for example, again, uh, for simplicity, we'll just look at a valve stopper system. Okay, and uh, is a single use, okay, single dose. So 
there is uh, roughly you know, three stages. There's a pre-capping, post-capping, and upon use. So pre-capping, you mentioned the, the sealing important at the pre-capping is the secondary sealing surface. So that is the so the seal, the secondary seal is the seal that it, we need to evaluate. Then post capping is the primary lens seal. So for post capping, then, then we need to evaluate the lens seal. Okay, CCI failure possible at lens seal. Upon use is the puncture site as the needle punctures through the rubber stopper. Okay, so then the puncture site is the is the is the sealing surface, is the, the the seal. But of course, because it's single use, then you know we don't really need to consider that part. So it's really just the pre-capping primary uh, secondary seal and the post-capping primary seal. Okay, so this is just one example. Okay, other considerations. So just now we talked about single dose. So what about multi-dose? So for multi-dose, you actually have to puncture it, the stopper has to reseal, and then you puncture it again for the second or third or fourth excess. Okay, so the stopper actually has to reseal back. So this so is no longer one um is no longer this they become more important okay to assess this multi-dose um the seal the, the the seal integrity of the product package for such multi-dose application and hence there is this in use more okay to understand um if the product package uh the degree of protection required between and during dosage assess so yeah, so this is one special case. Another special case, low temperature applications. The typical glass transition temperature of a halobutyl rubber formulation is minus 55 degrees Celsius to minus 65 degrees Celsius. So glass transition temperature is the temperature whereby below which the rubber material will lose its rubber properties and become a rigid material. Okay, so it is then important if the storage temperature of the drug product goes below the glass transition temperature of the rubber. So for example, uh, for gene and cell therapy, which usually requires minus 80, minus 120, or even lower. So such therapies, we need to evaluate the possible CCI breach at that temperature. Because at that temperature, again, the rubber loses rubber properties, it becomes rigid, and all materials contract at low temperatures. But it can materials contract at low temperatures at different rates. So the rate at which it contracts, which is called thermal coefficient of expansion or shrinkage for rubber and glass is very different. Okay. But there are some solution. Uh, so in fact, West, we have a solution for such application that is to use a polymer container instead. In West, we have this uh, polymer container polymer material, which is uh, Dicule Crystal Zenith. So this material has a comparable thermal co coefficient of thermal expansion as rubber. So they would shrink at the same rate and hence reduce the risk of CCI failure. Okay, so if you're interested, uh, please reach out to us. Okay. Then, um, so it's just a summary. So we need to, again, you see, we need to consider the different uh, failure modes at different stages. Okay, so we need to understand really at which stage, at each stage, uh, where are the possible failures, which is critical and which 
needs to be evaluated. All right, now we move on to the CC test methods. Okay, so we mentioned about deterministic and probabilistic methods that is introduced in the USP chapter 1207. Uh, this is the definition that we have pulled out from the chapter, but just a simpler breakdown in for better comparison, easier comparison. Deterministic methods are objective and quantitative. On the other hand, probabilistic methods are generally subjective and qualitative. Okay, so uh, what it means, deterministic follows predictable sequence for detection. So it's really a science understanding. Whereas uh, probabilistic methods relies on series of events that would occur, but these events are actually associated with uncertainties and random outcomes. So you can't really predict. Okay. Then for deterministic methods, usually little or no sample preparation. So there's lesser room for human error. Whereas uh, probabilistic methods usually require sample preparation. Last but not least, deterministic methods can be non-destructive. Whereas probabilistic methods are usually destructive. So if you know if it is non-destructive, then you actually have the samples which you can evaluate, you can you can use, you can evaluate and check the possibility of a false negative. Okay, below are some examples of this deterministic and probabilistic methods. For today, I will go through a few examples of deterministic methods you know what are their pros and cons how they are how they work okay but before going to it um, again just a recap stability selection of test methods again there is no one test method that's appropriate for all product package systems for because different test methods they actually test differently they have they, we could have different purpose of testing it and um, so we need to select the right method to test. Okay. So after we select, we need to validate the method based on the product application. Okay. One thing to note is that the method selected must be sensitive enough okay, to detect and quantitate the selected more. And wherever possible, to use deterministic methods versus probabilistic method. Okay. Summary: uh, uh, met multiple methods may be required, uh, even for a product package, because of the different stages of, of the product lifecycle. Uh, to understand um, different leaks, are we looking at really the mall? Or are we looking at major defects? Okay, and because the product package could be made of different material construction, so a certain method might just not be feasible for that particular material that the package is made of. Okay. So now we look at the various um, deterministic methods. Okay, number one, we have this helium leak. Helium leak, the method operation. So we have the containers, we would puncture them and we fill it with helium. Then we will seal up with epoxy. Okay, so these samples would, we would then place it in a chamber that is connected to a mass spectroscopy unit and it is specifically tuned to detect helium. Okay. And then we put a vacuum on the chamber and the rate of leak helium is then measured. So advantage is the testing time is very fast. We can test at various temperatures. It is highly sensitive since the mass spectroscopy unit is specifically tuned for helium. OK, 
Okay, disadvantages, sample preparation is required. Okay, because we need to puncture and fill the containers with helium. Uh, it's disruptive. Okay, and since it's a leak test testing for leakage of the helium gas from the container, there is this potential of false negative due to blockage by the uh, drug product, the, the container content. So there is this case whereby protein, a biologic uh, product, the protein clock, the leak, and result in false negative. Okay. No uh, need for additional setup for permeable packaging. So if it's a permeable packaging, uh, then we actually need additional setup for it to work. Okay. So in West, we have this, um, all the test methods that I'll be presenting, we actually have this capability in West. Okay. So in West, for Helium Leak, we already have uh, various experience with this testing. So we have several methods for various systems that's already developed. Then, um, and we can actually perform helium leak at frozen and cryogenic real-time analysis. So cryogenic is really less than minus 180 degrees Celsius. So it would be, it is required for, it is the storage temperature for like um, cell therapy. Okay, a second method, high voltage leak detection, HVLV for short. So the method operation, field containers, uh, liquid field containers exposed to an electrical current, and when there's a breach, it will create a spark. Okay, so the advantage of such HVLV test is that there is no sample preparation needed, very rapid testing time, and it is non-disruptive. Okay. However, we need to evaluate and the impact of the product stability from exposure to the high voltage. Okay. So though it doesn't sort of dis disrupt the package, but how if the product is affected by the high voltage, we need to verify. Okay. Disadvantages. Fixtures and additional setup is required. Uh, the content, the product package content has to be a conductive solution. Again, it's a leak test and testing for breach in the package. So you, um, there is potential again for the false negative created by protein clogging. Method development and validation is needed for each package. Okay, this is a must because there are various um, different uh, variables that could that you know depend on the fuel volume of the product package we're talking about the viscosity of this fuel volume conduct which could impact you know it will means a difference in the um, conductivity of the fuel volume. So all these are factors and hence we need to validate for each for each package. Only for room temperature analysis. Okay, so, uh, but the thing is, uh, only room temperature analysis. In West, we can actually perform this for different, different um, package formats. So, valve stopper, cartridge, preferred switch. All right, next, laser based heat space analysis. O2. Laser based head space analysis works um, with a container uh, with sufficient head space. Okay, so what happens is the head space is either filled with 0% oxygen and placed in an atmospheric environment or filled with atmospheric oxygen and placed in an environment with 0% of oxygen. And we just test the migration of oxygen in or out of the package. Okay, so advantage, the testing time is very quickly, very fast, it's non-destructive, it's highly sensitive, okay, um, no sample preparation is needed. Okay, disadvantage, 
potentially long testing time because um, the gas diffusion rate could be very low. So we need to wait for it to, to, to the gas to diffuse and then we can measure the change in the gas amount of pressure. Again, Wes already have some uh, experience with this method and we have several methods already developed uh, for stopper and valve system. Okay. So the one we have only test for O2, there are um, other laser method space equipment that would test for other gas or just a general pressure changes. Last but not least, vacuum decay. Method operation, the containers use specifically, specially designed fixtures and a vacuum is applied. Um, any pressure increase are measured over time. Okay, very easy. So there's no sample preparation, non-disruptive. Uh, however, this advantage is we need to create the fixtures to, to, con to contain the containers. Okay, and the limit um, is around 10 micron. This is what the equipment in West um, is. Uh, we understand that there are more sensitive vacuum decay instruments out there, but we are not pursuing it. Okay, again, it has, um, um, we are not pursuing it because it has uh, various limitations. So, for example, just now about the custom fixtures, so it needs to be developed. And then there is also potential for protein clogging resulting in false negatives. Uh, one thing, another thing is in an empty container is needed. Uh, and in fact, it cannot be used to test shrinkage. Okay, it cannot be used to test syringe filled with liquid. So we are not um, pursuing this test, but we still can perform method development if um, customers require. All right, now we move on to, okay, so here is a simple guide, um, the methods that can be used for the different drug product. Okay, so if it's a liquid filled uh, syringe, we can use HPLD. If it's um, other formats, we can use helium-lick uh, if there's sufficient headspace to input the helium. Or we can use laser-based headspace analysis. Again, we need sufficient headspace. If it's a lifeline product, uh, we can use laser-based headspace because that, in a way, it can measure the content in the headspace over time, and um, helium is also another test that can be performed for release testing. Okay, here we have a table uh, that compares the different CCI methods. This is not um, complete. Definitely, there are other other factors that we can compare these test methods with, but. Um, over here is just uh, an example. So this is a comparison if they are probabilistic, deterministic, qualitative, quantitative, destructive or non-destructive, whether they can be on off the filling line, um, if it is possible to be used on a permeable material, if it's possible to be used on preferred syringe and cartridges, etc. So, of course, other factors would be how sensitive the method is. And as we mentioned just now, the temperature wise. So, all these are factors that we can compare, and accordingly, we can select the right one for the particular product package. Okay, so to end off, it's a very brief, so just a little promotion of what WES can do. So just now we went through the testing portion. So that's what our WES Analytical Laboratory 
that's situated in Exton, Pennsylvania, can help our customers to do contract testing, um, to do method development, validation, then the testing over stability for CCI. And then we have a team of technical customer support um, and we can help customers do product recommendation. So um, with the others, so if the customers let us know the drug product details, we can then make recommendations accordingly. So and we can also help them to perform stack up assessment. Another type of assessment is interference fit. So both are theoretical calculations that can be done to give a preliminary idea uh, if the combination would work with each other prior to testing with the actual physical samples. Then we also have a regulatory support team that um, helps to share uh, information, knowledge on uh, for CCI, understanding of and expectations of uh, regulatory and regulatory bodies that we've learned with our customers and we, so with this information we actually try to provide guidance and um, produce position papers to share this knowledge. Okay, so one source you can actually go to would be our West official, West Pharma official website. And on this website under Knowledge Center, we have one whole web page dedicated to container closure integrity. So uh, please uh, feel free to go to this website to learn about more information on CCI or uh, to contact us for more discussion. And thank you. So now I'll hand it over to Ankit. Ankit, please. Yes. Yes, thank you, Jiamin, for such knowledgeful pre presentation on growing importance of container closer integrity. Uh, I would like to thank you all my attendees for attending our Wednesday 18 September 2018 webinar. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. You will get watch-on-demand recording email from Biospectrum shortly. Signing out, your host, Ankit Kankar.